Are you ready to be part of a special today? A special today. Today is a special today. And we're going to look at how. This is such a blessing. If you want to turn with me to Luke chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 18, 18 through 21 tonight. Thinking about a special today. We'll start with verse 17. The book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to Jesus. He opened the book and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to deliver those who are crushed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began to tell them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Amen. This, this special today, this special today is still going on right now. And that's the blessing tonight, is that we're part of a special today that spans more than we can think of as a normal daytime. Um, we're going to look tonight at how God's concept of time is totally different than ours. And since he stands outside of time, when we think of today, for him, it's all happening at once. And so this time period now that we're living in, is together considered a special day, one particular day that we can look at as today. And what a blessing that we can enter into that same time period that when Jesus was ministering on the earth, the same things that he did, the same things that he promised are still happening right now and they're going to continue to happen and we can partake of that. I want to look at what he promised today that he was fulfilling. It was such an amazing thing. Um, how many hundreds of years earlier this has been prophesied through Isaiah. And this is taken from Isaiah chapter 61. If you want to read that later, I might read that later tonight, verses 1 and 2. And uh, that was what he had read in the synagogue. Uh, the scroll was opened up before him, and most likely as pastor has taught that he probably was reading from the Greek version, a Septuagint, and that's why what is written here in Luke is a little bit different than if you read actually Isaiah. The words used are a little different there, and uh, the Greek version is slight, slightly different in the words used for God there and, uh, and exactly what this was going to be doing, what Jesus was going to be doing, this coming one that was anointed of God. Um, but we're, I want to look at a few of those phrases tonight. And here, here's the welcome, here's the invitation, is that you can be as though you were with him on that day when he said that to everybody in that synagogue, that today the scripture is fulfilled in all of your hearing. Today is still today. What a good, what good news. And as we look tonight, I want you to read sometime later um, the first part of Luke 4. And as always, context is everything, and it's so interesting when you go to the Gospel of Luke and see what happened in chapter 4. This was immediately following Jesus being baptized by John in the wilderness. And so he had gone through a great period of testing and trial in the wilderness following his being baptized in water and receiving the Holy Spirit as the Son of Man. And he had went through 40 days of not eating and having the devil continually tempt him. And it, it ended in a, uh, a few different temptations that we know that you've probably heard. He, uh, the devil asked him to turn bread, uh, rocks into bread and so on. And think about that. Jesus had been fasting that whole time. He finally got through all of that fasting and then this is the next thing recorded for us is he goes into, into the town here, to Nazareth, um, returning in the power of the Spirit, it says in verse 14. And that's when he got up and, and said these things. He'd been anointed by the Spirit. He'd gone through that time of testing and trial, not eating that whole time, which I think is very symbolic. We're gonna, I'm going to touch on that in a minute. Um, the, the fact that he had been fasting that whole time, I think, is very um, 
very notable when you look at the what he's quoting, what he's going to be doing. Um, it's kind of intimately connected to that. But let's let's look at some of these things that he promised for us. This this awesome Lord, this awesome Son of God. He promised to preach good news to the poor. Good news to the poor, most translations have it. That word for poor, though, in Hebrew can mean several different things. It can mean the ones that have been humbled or, or even humiliated. It can mean ones that have been afflicted. And then that's where that concept of being poor also comes in. Somebody that has gone through so many things from other people that they really just don't have anything left. They've just been beaten down by life, compressed from here, from there, from everywhere. Um, how many of us feel like that? especially before we come to the Lord, but that still happens after. But this promise is to everybody, those that have yet to believe and those that have already believed. He's going to preach good news to those people. And that is the small group of people, if you want to look at it that way, that actually realize that something needs to change. They're not happy with the way that the world works. They're not one of the ones that likes to see how far they can get ahead by trampling on the heads of other people. This group that Jesus promised to preach good news to are the ones that have been trampled, the ones that realize that the way the world works is not good, and they don't really want anything to do with it. And they're tired of the way that this world system works where everybody's out for themselves. And Jesus comes to that person and, and has good news for that person that the kingdom of God is about to break into being in their life if they will just believe. Think about how much of Jesus' earthly ministry, he says, was to preach the kingdom of heaven, to preach the kingdom of God. What is that? That kingdom of God that he came preaching is a place where what's supposed to happen happens. It's a place where righteousness exists. It's a place where those that are trodden down actually get the hand up. They, they get helped up when they are trampled and they're not left in that position when they've been doing the right thing seemingly, when it seems like they've been trying to do what's right and yet they still get taken advantage of. Jesus comes bringing good news as, yeah, I have an answer for you. I have healing for you. I made you, and the things you're going through aren't going to last forever, but I have something much and far better for you in the future. If you will just go through this time of trial here on earth and look to me and respond in love with my nature after you've received me, you'll be able to respond in a different way. That's good news. These people don't have to live as the afflicted, as the humbled, as the poor anymore, but he's going to beautify them. He's going to glorify them. He has promises for them that they're going to they're gonna receive salvation. And I want to look at uh, Psalm 149.4, which I think ties into this. The same word is used there, um, the afflicted, the humble, the poor. Psalm 149, if you want to read there, ch uh, chapter 149, verse 4. Such an awesome verse when you realize again uh, the words used in Hebrew there are kind of kind of a double meaning once that we have the the blessed revelation of Jesus we know exactly what is happening here it says for Yahweh takes pleasure in his people he crowns the humble with salvation he will beautify another translation has he glorifies he beautifies the afflicted or the humble or the poor with salvation. And that word salvation there is the same root word where the word Jesus comes from. So Jesus' very own name is, is how God is going to beautify us, the, those afflicted ones. That's what Jesus came preaching. He, pray, he brought good news to the people that had been looking for an answer. How long do I have to live like this? Where's my answer? Here he is in the flesh. Here he is. If we will just come to him, he promises us, a time of beautifying, a time of glorifying. And it's in process right now, and it's going to be perfected when he comes again in glory the second time. So what, what is right happens. That's the good news that he preaches. God's kingdom come, can come about in our life no matter where we are. 
And how much more when believers come together, when believers live together in harmony, you have all those multiple people living the right way, doing the right things, living the way that God intended out of love, out of mercy, out of grace, and not trampling and not taking advantage and um, all of those things that the world does and prizes. So that's good news Jesus brought. He brings that to you. He brings that to me. If we'll just believe him. The second thing he came to do, he has, it says here, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. How many of us can qualify for that? How many of us have been brokenhearted? That word there is so uh, poignant. It means, it comes from a word, a Hebrew word meaning to, to break into pieces, to shatter. It's even used of when people are torn apart by wild animals or a lion. Imagine that happening to your heart and how many people in life are in that position. Jesus is coming directly to them, to you. If you feel like that, he's coming to you. And he comes with healing for that. He doesn't just give you sympathy and say, oh, wow, I wish you feel better. I hope you feel better in the morning. Or this isn't going to last forever. But he comes with healing. He, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And that Hebrew word, very, very cool word. It's used for so many different things in the Old Testament. And here's a really cool one. It's used to mean to bind up. And, you know, that makes sense if you think about your heart being broken in multiple pieces. Here is Jesus taking them together and kind of almost tying it back together until it's back in a whole piece. But here's a really, a really neat way to look at this. This same word in Hebrew in the Old Testament is used to mean to saddle a donkey or a horse to heal, to bind up. And think about what that means in, in relation to how Jesus relates to us and our broken heart. He's going to saddle the brokenhearted. He's going to get it ready to be ridden again. He's going to get it ready to carry a load again. So your heart, though it might seem like it's been shattered into a million pieces, this Son of God that it was sent directly from God to you as coming to, to bind that together again, to heal that heart. And he's getting it to a place where he then can sit on the throne of your heart, just like it's been saddled, just like a horse has been prepared to have a rider to direct it, to take it places where it's never been before. This is what that Jesus has come to do. He's going to come and restore you to put back those broken pieces, but he's not going to just send you back out on your own again but he's going to prepare you to go with him. He's going to lead you from then on if you will just let him in. And this applies both to those that have never received him and it applies to us that have received him in time past. Every single day, he is healing the damage done that is done in this wicked world system. He's healing the damage if we let him in and he's getting that heart back together again. He's preparing it. He's, he's getting it ready to be saddled up and so he can sit down and have dominion in our life and have things work the way they're supposed to work and we can go forth into God's kingdom into a newness that we haven't known before. That's what Jesus was anointed by the Spirit to do. That's what he came to do and that's what he's still doing. Jesus can lead from within. He can saddle up our brokenhearted so he can guide us from within. He, pre he came to preach and to proclaim release to the captives. And um, before we get to that, though, I want to look at the original in Hebrew because it talks about him also um, giving recovery of sight to the blind. And uh, in, ver in Isaiah 61, 1, that's mentioned first. So how many of us feel like we're blind in life? And Jesus talked about that in various parables, the concept of whether you see or whether you're blind. And Jesus was sent to those that are blind. And I want to want to look at John chapter 9, if you want to turn there with me. I want to look at this concept of blindness and how it's not a bad thing. Obviously, Jesus came to heal the physically blind, and he still does that today. If you can't see with your natural eyes, Jesus has provided for healing from that through his suffering and death on the cross. And that is a given, and we see that throughout the Gospels. He healed the blind many, many times so that they could see again. But what about spiritual blindness? He says in John 9, 39, 
Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment that those who don't see may see and that those who see may become blind. Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see. Therefore your sin remains. So Jesus comes to the ones that really don't know what they're doing. They're going through life. And they're the ones that are doing wrong things, but they're really trying to do the right thing. They just can't seem to see the right way to go. They really want to do the right thing, but they continually to fall and, and to stumble. And Jesus came to those people that recognize that they're blind. I can't see. Somebody guide me. Somebody, somebody show me how to walk so I, keep, so I uh, quit stubbing my toe on everything, right, spiritually. Jesus came to those people to give them sight again. And that's us. Sometimes we're blinded by life by its cares, by its uh, temptations, by its hard times, by its anxieties, the things that come on us from various angles, friends, family, job situations, um, things from the past that come back to our memory that we have to deal with, emotional trauma, physical trauma, um, relationship trauma, all of those things that temporarily blind us and get us looking on the here and now and try to work things out on our own and end up making them worse. Jesus came to those people. He comes to us and he brings recovering of sight, recovering of sight so we can see. And he, he promises that in the book of Revelation uh, to a specific church that he said that they needed a, a salve for their eyes that they might see again. They've lost their way. They've lost their first love. That can happen to us. So it's not just about those that have yet to come to salvation, although that is most definitely one of his promises. He comes to those that need that guide, that don't want to wander in life anymore and just try to figure out things by their own natural reasoning. He comes to give them a spiritual sight to see him, to see the right way, to see what living for him is all about. And he, he reminds us of that every single time that we say yes when he's, when he's, as it were, right in front of us saying, I am come to recover your sight if you admit you're blind. All we have to do is admit we're blind sometimes. And that is when the healing can come, both naturally and spiritually. So let's look at the next thing that he promised. Freedom. Freedom to the captives. If you want to look back in uh, chapter 4, verse 18 of Luke. Who needs freedom? Who feels like you've been a captive? And like you have been taken hold of to do somebody else's will? Uh, how many of us feel like that growing up as children? You, you are... Into sub, uh, under subjection to your parents and you have to obey them. Um, we have that, that feeling in the uh, job situation. You've got a boss over, you have to do what they say. And um, the marriage situation where the, the wife obeys the husband and as, uh, looks to him as the head, just as Jesus is the head of the church. But all those things, um, all those things aside, we're still captives to sin. We're still captives to other things in life. To, to people that really should have no control over us, that we that we let have control, whether it's just through intimidation or, God forbid, you know, a, f a physical actually capturing and being taken against your will somewhere. But Jesus comes to proclaim liberty to you, freedom. And that word for freedom in Hebrew and from Isaiah 61, it's used of calves running forth out of the stall. When you open the stall door and the, the horse finally has all been cooped up and it just bolts out. That's what Jesus comes to bring to us. He comes to bring freedom to the captives, those that have been held down by bondages, those that have been held down by people in life. Jesus is coming to you and he's bringing freedom. If you will let him, if you will say yes and receive what he's doing for you, if you say yes to him in your heart, and believer or not, new believer, old believer, he can, re he can release you from that stall, from that, that being pent up, that being captured. And right along with that, it says, he is delivering those who are crushed. He's setting free the shattered ones. And I want to look at, as I mentioned earlier, the connection for him fasting. What does that, what does that mean that this happened after 
he had been fasting all that time. If you want to look again, this is kind of a Bible study night on Wednesdays. Isaiah 58. Cha- uh, Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6. Isn't he awesome? Isaiah 58. We'll read verse 5 too. Let's see. Actually, let's let's just read a few of those verses because God is looking for a person here that is doing his will and he's he's uh kind of getting in Israel's face as a nation for what they're doing instead of what he wants them to do. Let's let's look at the first ver- first few verses from the beginning of the chapter. Cry aloud, don't spare. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Deliver, declare to my people their disobedience and to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness and didn't forsake the ordinance of their God, they ask of me righteous judgments. They, they delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted, say they, and you don't see? Why have we afflicted our soul and you don't notice? Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure and oppress all your laborers. Behold, you fast for strife and contention and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You don't fast today as to make your voice be heard to be heard on high. Is this the fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to humble his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under himself? Will you call this a fast and an acceptable day to Yahweh? In verse 6, Isn't this the fast that I have chosen, to release the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Isn't it to distribute your bread to the hungry, and that you bring the poor who are cast out to your house, when you see the naked that you cover him, that you not hide yourself from your own flesh? Then your light will break out as the morning, and your healing will appear quickly. Then your righteousness shall go before you, and Yahweh's glory will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and Yahweh will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. So that is the fast that he wants. And think about Jesus during that 40 days being tempted of the devil to do all these things, to get him off course of what he had come to do. And here in verse in chapter 4 of, of Luke, the first four verse, for first uh, several verses and then down on to 18 we see what happened he came to preach this same thing that ja- that Yahweh was looking for that God was looking for instead of judgment he was looking for somebody to release the captives he didn't want people to to fast to to look like they were holy to other people and then go out and oppress everybody no he was looking for somebody to let the oppressed go free to let the oppressed go free. That is what Jesus said he had come to do, to deliver those who are crushed. Those words there are very similar. It means to set free the ones that have been shattered, the ones that have been crushed, the ones that have been pulverized. And Jesus, with this glorious fast that he had went through, was now fulfilling that in this special today that is still lasting. We can be part of that today right now because he is living God's true fast the, the one that brings deliverance, the one that sees those fetters that have held you down and that breaks them apart. Isn't he amazing? Isn't, isn't he amazing? And uh, the Lord came to do these things because he had been anointed by the Spirit. And that's what I want to end on tonight um, is the fact that Jesus came to do those things, not only on earth for those three short years of ministry, but he yet does them now, both directly, spiritually, one-on-one with people, but also through his people that have said yes to him, that have had this word preached to them and have said yes, and have had their heart healed, have their heart mended, have their heart been put back together, that have been lifted up from being afflicted, have had that good news preached that if you will just believe God's kingdom is among you, if you will just come to Jesus 
and and bow before him and let him be your Lord as he was destined to do, then you will rise up. He will glorify you. He will beautify you with salvation. And what's right will start to happen. We know it's not going to be in fullness until he comes again and God's kingdom is established over the whole earth. But right here and now, we have taste of that kingdom. And we see it when we all come together in church services. We see it when we're out together with other believers. We see it when we pray and minister out one to one another. And that's, that's my emphasis tonight that I want to end on, is that not only does Jesus offer that to us, but if, you can, if your mind can get, can get in this realm, he wants you to do what he did. Then he wants you to take up that torch. He wants to pass that torch to you as his person, as his regenerated new human being, this new kind of person that has been born again, that now has him living on the inside. And as his body, you're going to go out and you're going to do what he did. You're going to do these same things to other people. You have the opportunity to go and to find those that have been trodden down and that are looking for somebody to deliver them, that recognize, yeah, I don't want to live the way this world lives. I'm not like other people. I'm not like the world system. Something's not right. Why can't I find the right way? This, nothing seems to be working right. He wants you to go to those people and say, God has the right way. There's a reason that something doesn't seem right. It's because you haven't yet met him. He wants you to go forth and bring that good news to people. He wants you to go forth and to heal the brokenhearted, to be with them in their time of need, to not only speak kind words, but through his Holy Spirit, minister actual healing to them through being with them and through speaking words of encouragement and and through gifts of healings and all the, the things that come as part of his Spirit's anointing. So just as Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit right before this happened, again, remember, he was baptized in water, and then the Holy Spirit came and descended on him. Then he had his time of tribulation and trial in the desert, and then he came to reveal himself as the deliverer. And once we receive that same Holy Spirit, from him after we've been born again by him and after we come to him to be baptized in the Holy Spirit we can go out like he did we can heal the brokenhearted we can bring recovery of sight to the blind we can bring freedom to the captives we can let loose their bonds and let them know you don't have to stay in bondage to sin anymore those things that keep you down and keep you serving them instead of God instead of what you want to be doing you can go free you can go free because the Lord of glory has come and he's here right now and he wants to free you if you will just say yes. And we can set free those shattered ones, the ones that have been pulverized by life. If we will just do what Jesus did, if we will hear his promise to us, if we will come to him and let that healing happen, receive him, let him saddle up our heart as it were and, and take off and to to bring us into his kingdom and to ride us into new places of glory up up the mountaintop to the to the place on top that we can't even imagine what it's like up there then we'll start to do those same things for other people once we've received that same spirit that has anointed him we can say that the spirit of the lord yahweh is on me as well because it is on jesus it is also on me because i've received that same anointing how amazing, how glorious that we can go out and do what he did because it's still today. He said, today, this, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Well, guess what? It's still today. And as we see elsewhere in scripture, while it's yet called today, don't harden your hearts because this day called today isn't going to last forever. It's not going to last forever. There's going to come a time when the Lord says, okay, it's done. What I've want to happen has been accomplished. My body is finally complete. It's ready to be prepared and to be presented to my son. The father is going to see this glorious church has been finally completed. It's time for him to come back and to receive it. But until then, it's called today. Until then, it's that same today that he proclaimed back then. And so if you hear his voice today, He's here with you. He's right here in your midst, no matter where you are. If you're right here in one of these pews, if you're on a couch, if you're in your bed, if you're walking somewhere, if you're listening to this in the future, no matter where you are, 
that same Lord is right there with you and he's saying the same things to you. So just believe just like those people in the synagogue, those few people that said yes, be like them and listen and, and let him in and let him let the, do the healing and then go forth like he's promised and do the same for others. Amen? Amen. Any questions tonight before we end? Any? All right, thank you. And uh, as always, let's uh, end with prayer and think about the things in our life that we need healing from and remember that right here in our midst, the Lord is. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for coming and not leaving us where we were. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming and being anointed and going through that time of temptation and trial. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up, not giving in to the devil's temptations and to his calls to abandon your calling. Thank you, Lord, for staying faithful. Thank you for being with us and for letting us know that it is all right. It's going to be all right because you are here. We've not been left alone. You haven't left us orphans. You are coming to us. You will come for us again. No matter where we look, Lord, you are. The here and the now and our past and our future, you've always been there. We thank you, Lord. We open ourselves tonight. We say yes to you. We say yes to you and we, we take off the blinders. We recognize that we have been blind in many ways. Lord, we admit it so that you might heal us and set us forth in the right way so that you might come in and bind up this broken heart, that you might piece it back together, Lord, that you might get it ready for your presence in our innermost being, Lord. We, we give it up to you. We lay bare before you those hidden areas that we've kept from other people. And we trust you right now, Lord, for healing. Right now and in the coming days and weeks, we trust you for healing for those areas that no one else has seen, that we might go out, Lord, as cast from the stall that have been cooped up for far too long. Thank you, Lord, for your healing touch right now. Thank you, Lord. Amen.